Well, good morning. Welcome to Grace Point Church. We are glad you're here this morning as we have come to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's begin to worship right now by standing together. We'll be lifting up our voices in a song of praise and celebration to the one we love. So we pour out our praise to you. 
This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of trumpet, with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning to Grace Point. Um, we are broadcasting live from the North Pole today, and I uh, have a few general announcements. Thank you for uh, coming in today and 
For all of you that are online, uh, we are glad you are tuning in with us. Um, you, can, you can give online through the website, uh, and uh, financially, we, we appreciate that. The church is, is doing well, so uh, continue with that. Also, uh, Nancy has gotten a few of the, uh, the uh, journals in for, uh, it has the scripture in it on one side and writing opportunity on the other. Uh, I use these. They're great. Actually, I stick it right in my Bible so that uh, I have it with me and I can work on it whenever I would like to. Um, Tim, would you check on the reindeer outside for me? That was a joke. <laughs> but I did, I did tell Ken that I was going to try to find the sled and hook up the dogs. So anyhow, but <laughs> mush. This morning, we're going to be looking at a section that is a powerful section. And as I was thinking about this section, there's a, there's a show that's been on TV, and it started in 2010. I think it's still airing, but I'm not sure. Um, that was called The Undercover Boss. So I think I have a picture of it up here. Oh, I got all the pictures up there. All right. In this, this was, uh, they would take a high, position executive, owner of the corporation or leader, and they would put him in an entry-level position in the company. He spends about a week undercover, and you can see this is, this is the uh, mayor of Pittsburgh. Uh, he did a number of jobs, but one of them was working in sanitation, so he's, he's lifting uh, trash cans for a week. And he gets to know people that he's working with and understand what they're dealing with, what they're, they're going through, what their day is like. At the end of this week, he sits down with the people that he worked with and, and he commends them. He says, we're going to get you, you know, more of this and more of that, maybe some training. And he, he's really honest with them. And I think in that week, he gets to understand what it's like to be on the front lines in their job. So in looking at the section that we're going into, this is in Philippians chapter 2, if you'd like to turn there with me. It's one of the most powerful sections about, in all of Scripture, about who Jesus was and what he came to do. So starting in verse 1, he says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rival rivalry and conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. What's interesting about this section is that it starts right off with this list of things. Any of this, any of that, any of all of this you have. The most important phrase in there is in Christ. And at the end of the section that I read, it says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So the bookends of this beginning section of this passage are in Christ. You have this in Christ. So rather than it being... If you have any of this, check your pocket, see if you've got a little bit here, a spare change of any kind of encouragement, let people know. It doesn't really go that way. The idea is the translation would be better to say, since being in Christ, we have this. We have it. We need to explore it. We need to let it out. We need to participate in it. So if being in Christ, we have encouragement... Encourage others. 
If being in Christ, we have comfort from love, I think of the passage where it says God loved us first, so we ought to love others. Any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit. This this word participation is also the same word that we looked at in the beginning of this chapter 1. It's fellowship, it's koinonia, it's partnership. We have partnership in the Spirit. That's what keeps us moving together. We have fellowship and participation in the gospel message. Not only does it something we share, but it's something that we experience first. Because as we experience it, then we can actually give it to others. And I've heard an idea once that that we need to preach to ourselves first. And that doesn't mean you, you go get a degree and you stand up front in front of the mirror and you talk to yourself, but it might mean that you need to talk to yourself. Because sometimes the lies in our world and the lies of the enemy teach us something else. They don't teach us that God loves us. They don't teach us that, that we are a chosen people that he has picked out to show his grace to. So the words that come to us are, you're a small person, it doesn't matter who you are, you're a failure, all these other words. So we need to speak to ourselves the truth about what God has said. And oftentimes I remind myself and others that as we read God's word, it gives words to the Holy Spirit to teach and encourage us. Without these words, we're adrift. We have no direction, no heading, no truth coming into our lives. Watching the news and the TV and all that stuff, it's not going to give you the truth of what God has said about you. You need to receive it from his word. So we have this affection and sympathy in Christ as well. And that, that's a term that's called tenderheartedness. God softens our hearts as we listen to his voice. And he will speak to us. He will speak to us about things around us. He'll speak to us about the people around us. But he'll speak to us about ourselves. And so listening to the words, you know, it says that if you look in the mirror and you, you don't recognize who you are and what's going on in your life, and you walk away and you forget, that's not helpful. But as we look into God's word and we reflect on, on what God is saying about us, that's a point of change. Tenderheartedness. In chapter 1, Paul talks to the Philippian church about being, that his joy may be full, that affection comes from Christ. Having the same mind, same love, and one accord. This simply means unity and harmony. That doesn't mean we're unanimous and all the same. But it's a unity that comes together. It brings diversity in our community, in our church. We're not all the same, and we have to acknowledge that. We might have different ideas, But unity can take those different ideas and make something beautiful out of it. And that beauty is the harmony in the body of Christ. See, the idea is that myself and let's say Ken, we will be more harmonious or together on things if we are walking with Christ. We may start out here. He may have very different life experience than I had. But as we begin to walk with Christ, we begin to walk together. And as we get to know one another and know Christ, we have tenderheartedness. We love one another. We talk about the comfort that we have received in Christ. We have encouragement. In fact, that word encouragement is the same word that's used of the Holy Spirit. Paraclesis. 
Then it goes on in verse 3. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Plato wrote that the state of mind which ter- submits to divine order of the universe and does not exalt itself is humility. To have such a mindset that when things happen, it doesn't cause us to stumble, doesn't startle us. We trust in one who runs things much greater than us. Our faith is in God. And to not only look to your own interest, you still have to look to your own in- your interest, but to look to others. God will provide. Jesus is the foundation of Christian unity. Without Christ, there's no chance of harmony. The second section, which is one of the most powerful sections in the New Testament that talks about Christ, starting in verse 5 again, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Here is what it looks like who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." This is the passage they call the kenosis, the emptying himself. What if I was to to say that we had an undercover boss, and he came into the company, lived in the company for a week, and realized that the company had a great need And he knew it would cost him his wealth. He knew it might cost him his career. And it may even cost him his life. That's what this section is about. This is what Christ came to do. He came down into this world, existed in human form, paid the sin, paid for the sin that we all have. So let me take this apart a little bit. He was in the form of God. This word form is used three times in this passage. It's actually two different words in the original Greek. First off, the form of God. That's the essential nature. Morphe is the word in Greek. The essential nature of God is in Christ, is in Jesus It's also the word metamorphosis, which is a translation of something to something else, or transformation. That same word, it means it's the essential nature of God is in him. But he also said that it's not something that he was going to grasp or cling to, something that he must not let slip from his grip. I often think that we respond out of things in our lives more out of fear than out of faith and trust. If we could really see who we are and how we respond and why we respond to situations, if we had the perspective of the Holy Spirit or of God, we would see that many of our responses are not out of faith and trust, but out of fear. It's always rolling around in us. Jesus didn't have that. Because it says, he was not worried about letting this slip from his grasp. He was not going to control. He was not going to try to keep it, his form of God, in this essential nature on him. Then it goes on to say he emptied himself. He chose to do this. But he gave up his glory. He gave up his wealth. He gave up his honor. 
came down, was born as a baby to a young family that had very little. The form of God. Then it goes on in verse 7. He says, taking the form of a servant. Now, this is the second time the same word is used for form here. The essential nature. So, we have Christ coming down to this earth, taking on the form, essential nature of God, but as a servant. Taking on the redemptive work as God. Servant. And then he goes on in verse 8, being found in the human form. This is a different word for form in the Greek. It means to fashion. It's a fashion. It, it's, it's something put on the outside. So he puts that human form onto his divinity as Christ. It's a temporary semblance. Something that he wears completely. I want to take you to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. If you want to turn over there. This may be a number of months ago that you studied that section. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. By the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. These two different words for form are in this passage. Don't be conformed to this world. So that's the, the outward taking on, the, the fashion that is put on. Don't put on the worldly clothes. Don't put on the worldly thinking. Actually take it off, as Paul often says. But put on Christ. Be transformed. That's the idea of the essential nature of who you are needs to be transfigured, transformed. And that's done by the renewal of your mind. By the power of the Holy Spirit working in you, but the truth of God Speaking to you. As I studied this section, I became aware of how, how poorly I perceive who Christ was, who Jesus was. I think at times we, we just kind of see that, well, he was... He was God, and he came down here. He was a man, and then he rose from the dead, and he was God again. That's not what this is saying. He was God and is God. Came down to this earth as God, as a servant. Died on the cross. For a little bit of time, he put on the clothes of humanity. And then he was resurrected. And the disciples saw him as a resurrected Lord. There's one other section before he actually died on the cross. It's called the Mount of Transfiguration. And he took a few of his disciples up on the mountain. And they fell asleep as usual. But when they woke up, there was Jesus in all of his glory. With Moses and Elijah talking. And he, Jesus told him, don't say anything about this until I've risen from the dead. That is Jesus in his glory. He kept that. He did not discard that. But it came under the cloak of his humanity. He covered it up so that he could then be the servant to all of us, to redeem us. Jesus' sacrifice we'll see, is his example to us. What's interesting about this section is that Paul takes us from, here's what you need to be as the body of Christ, what you have in Christ, and then he goes into this great picture of what Jesus did as an example of being a servant. 
Paul always takes great theology and makes it practical. Because I believe that he thought if theology does not cause us to act, it's not of much use. And so he takes the example of Christ and shows us what Jesus did as our example of humility and love. The last section starts in verse 9. It says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the name above every name. Those words there, the name, it's not a name, it's the name. It's a recognition of God the Father puts on Christ. He deserves all praise and worship. It denotes the divine presence, the majesty. He deserves adoration, worship, and praise. And at that name, every knee will bow, and every tongue confess, Jesus is Lord. In the translation of the the Old Testament, from Hebrew to Greek, the Hebrew word Jehovah is translated the Lord. So what Paul is saying here, this is Jehovah God. This is the Lord that we worship. In Romans 10, verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. A belief and a confession of who Jesus is is at the center of our faith as Christianity. Nothing else. When I talk to somebody and I can tell they're kind of figuring out what they believe, I say, do you believe this? Do you, can you say that? Is that what your heart says? And I'm not afraid to say you are a believer. All these other things that we add on to what it means to be a Christian is not the core. The core is who is Christ? And what do you confess about him? That's at the center of what Paul is saying here. Confession about Christ is the key to Christian unity and harmony. Without that, we don't have anything. Not only does God give that name to Christ, but that name is also in some ways, given to us. We call Christians, right? But to the church of Philadelphia, in Revelation 3, verse 12, it says, The one who conquers or overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. This is what Jesus is saying to the church of Philadelphia. I will write on you my name. And another place in chapter 2 actually says that Jesus said we would get a name that only we know. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. But newness and the name being placed on us is central to what God is doing and doing for us as well, giving us a new name. I don't believe this is sacrilegious, but Jesus has been exalted, and we will be too. It says when we humble ourselves, then God will lift us up. 
That's at the core of our Christian faith. Now, I could have probably spent three messages talking about three verses about who Jesus was and what he gave up and all those things. But Paul is very centered on, if this is true in you, it's going to be exhibited in the harmony and unity of your body, the church. That's the truth. Paul's theology is always practice. Live it out. We have a great example and hope for life-giving, redemptive relationships. In Hebrews chapter 10, I'll close with this on the last slide. In verse 24 through 25, it says this, And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For those of you who came, were able to make it in here, and for those of you who are online, continue to meet and fellowship with one another. Reach out and call one another. Find out what's going on in your lives. Encouragement is essential. Spur each other on to love and good works. Would you close with me in prayer? Loving Father, thank you for sending Christ. Thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you for coming and, and emptying yourself, taking on the form of us as human beings living through the pain and the challenges of this world and not only becoming a servant, but a servant who died on a cross. We thank you for that. Help us to become the people that you have intended us to be, a place of encouragement to stimulate one another to grow in our faith. to become like Christ as the example. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us respond to God's word by standing together, lifting up our voices in songs of praise and celebration.
sucker for my part And he was raised to overthrow the grave To this I hold my sin has been
praise, let there be no higher name. Jesus, Son of God, you lay down your perfect life, you are the sacrifice. Jesus, Son of God, you are Jesus, Son of God. On the altar of our praise, let there be no higher name. Jesus, Son of God, you lay down your perfect life, you are search team so please don't run away too far um, and, and please bear with us as we get prepped for zoom would you close with me heavenly father thank you for this day i'm reminded that as the snow covers our world here that purity and your forgiveness is so abundant that as we walk into the life that Christ has given us, that we have a fresh start. And I pray for anybody that is experiencing turmoil and, and difficulties, that they would come to you, and today would be the day of that start in Christ. I ask this in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God bless.